pretty sweet here. Uh, we have the temporary auto vlog uh, studios here. Uh, lots going on today. We've got our normal news segment where we're going to talk about a pretty sweet Lamborghini that came in on Monday. But it's been such a newsy week that we're going to break a couple things that just came over the transom this morning. We're going to jump right into that, uh, starting off with the Jeep Wrangler interior. Current model is pretty plasticky. A lot of the materials are, they look a little dated. It makes sense because it's a pretty old vehicle, but the new one looks pretty slick, I think. Yeah, and like you said, the current Wrangler has been on sale for a decade now, and it's came from an era when Chrysler did not have the best interior. Sure. Now we got to refresh halfway through with these new. Just for a I like the Connect quite a bit. So yeah, me too. It's solid. Uh, this version, because I don't think you can get the latest version in the current Wrangler. But yeah, it looks good. And I'm just wondering how uh, well it's going to hold up. Because as plastic as the current one is, it's pretty robust and easy to work. So that's kind of my uh, concern about it. But looks wise, really getting excited for this debut. We uh, pretty much know what's going to happen in LA. It's all but confirmed. If it's not in fact confirmed, it's it's you know it's coming. It's days away. I think we're pretty excited. Uh, our man Jules Stock. You got to check that out. Check out those two pictures. The kind of images you want to actually like pull up big on your screen. Let us know what you think. You know, let us know in the comments, comments either, either on that story or ping, ping us up here on the, on the, on the Facebook live, live stream. We'd love to hear from you. And yeah, yeah you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a good time of the year for uh, reveals, which brings. Over, uh, it came to us basically through a driver. It looks like basically one of their cover images maybe got uploaded a little bit early. I'm not sure. People. Hey, look at the new. We were just online this morning and you, you messaged me. You're like, uh, I think this is the new ZR1. And yeah. It looks pretty good, I think. Yeah, yeah, I was doing my usual morning routine, checking email, like seeing what was in the news, and I saw the subscription email. Now, what happens is Car Driver always sends like a preview of like, hey, this is what's in the next issue, and I was like, I think it's the ZR1. I think that's actually the ZR1. Yeah. So I forwarded it to you, um, and we're like, all right, well, we can't be the only ones that have seen this, so let's go with it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, Looks awesome. I mean, we're, we're showing the spy shots now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it looks like a Z06 on steroids. I mean, it, I, I'm picturing this as as like the Viper ACR is to the regular Viper. Um, we don't know all the details. The cover said 750 horsepower, but that's not an official figure. Right. Um, but yeah, and the hood looks like it's got some big bulge in there. So presumably a larger supercharger. Um, lots of arrow, big wing. Uh, the front end looks a little busy and weird, but I think it's going to be one of those that looks a little better in person. But yeah, that's Corvette. This thing's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to see this in the uh, in the flesh uh, coming up. I think uh, we're going to definitely hear more about this car in the very near future. Uh, looking at these pictures, though, it's it's everything we expected. It, um, you know, I'm really impressed with GM's aerodynamic treatments lately, especially on the Corvette, but also on the Camaro too. Like, they're really aggressive. They're just going for it. And it's like, you know, you could shave with some of these like splitters and the wings. It's, it's impressive. And I think the Corvette right now is really, it's competitive with all the European exotics. I mean, if you look at the, all the metrics, all the raw figures. I mean, 750 horsepower. I'm sure the zero to 60 time is going to be bonkers. It's going to be super lightweight, but also powerful. So yeah, I mean, you know, they did a great job with the, the Z06. So I mean, we knew this would be coming. We know that the C, uh, this generation of the Corvette is kind of on its way out, but this is a great way to celebrate it.
Yeah, uh, the Corvette, especially in the past few generations, have, has always kind of punched above its price point. Uh, and I'm expecting big things from this. Now, this is not going to be cheap. I mean, a Z06 already can push $100,000. So this is going to be deep, well, I wouldn't say deep into the six figures, but well over 100000 is yeah. probably what we're expecting with this. But, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a world-class competitor. I, it's been testing at the Nürburgring. Uh, but t to your point, like, the aero and the chassis tuning of with both the Camaro and the Corvette have been phenomenal. Um, they're really doing some amazing things in the past few years with this, and it's really been pretty impressive. I think... Uh yeah, I mean, that was a bit of a surprise this morning. But, uh, you know, let's keep things in the GM family here. This is, uh, this is actually the scheduled news segment. We were going to talk about the, uh, the 2019 GMC Sierra spy shots that came over. Uh, they actually came over just on Monday. So it's still fairly recent news. But, um, yeah, that's another key, key vehicle for them. Totally different segment. Uh, any other week, these would be pretty big news. Uh, I think the Sierra, uh, it's an evolutionary design from what we see from these pictures. It, uh, you know, it looks like they're trying to maybe bling it out a little bit more, maybe go with a little bit more design panache, but you can never really tell with spy shots. Like, there's always, like, fake, you know, sometimes, like, body armaments on it. You know, you don't really know what they're trying to do to keep guys like us from really knowing what's going on, but uh, it's a good-looking truck, I think. Yeah, we always get a batch of these, and we pour over it, like, with a fine-tooth comb, uh, trying to see what's new, what's different, what's different between this and the old spy shots. Um, but this is our clearest view of the car, or the, sorry, the truck yet. Um, it's still got all the wrapping on it, um, but most of the, like, the extra like mm. baggage and loose fitting has been there. Um, it is an evolution, but I think it's a little softer. It doesn't look like it's gotten okay. quite the, um, the, quite the aggressive like uh, cuts and lines and like the fenders. Uh, the front end looks a little bit smoother, but the grille, I think, looks even bigger than it is in the last generation. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of been uh, GMC's MO for the past few generations. It's, uh, since I think about 2007, that truck has just kind of evolved and not mm -hmm. really like been out through with an all-new design. It's fine. They sell tons of them, so if don't like mess with the formula too much. I actually, so I'm going to take a slightly different tact here. I agree with you that grill is insane. It looks huge. Uh, you can see those kind of like, almost like, like cut headlights, you know, that GMC uses a lot. But on the side, to me, that looks a little more aggressive. Like, that's sort of like, it's a cut like right below the belt line. It basically is a belt line. You're right, the fenders do look smoother. But to me, I feel like once we get all these wrappings off of it, we're going to be like, oh, there's a little bit more going on than maybe we thought. So, you know, we'll see. GMC, like, generally, the Sierra is the um, more of the design statement, usually, than the Chevy Silverado is, which we're also expecting a new version of pretty soon. Um, but, you know, we'll see. I mean, we've heard some rumblings that the Sierra and the Silverado might shift to some more aluminum. Uh, not confirmed, obviously. All of sort of the intelligence that I've gotten just from you know, different sources is that the big trucks for GM is going to use kind of a mix of materials. It'll be like alu some aluminum, but still a lot of steel, high strength steel, of course, and even some other materials mixed in there. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, that's right now, that's sort of the next like phase of trucks is what are you going to use to make your truck as robust as possible? I mean, with uh, the F-150 of this past generation, I mean, everybody knows they made the switch to aluminum. And even then, it was still, the GM vehicles were still pretty light uh, compared to that. Um, so, I th like you, I think the rumors have been something like the cab and uh, front is gonna, be, is gonna be steel, but I'm aluminum, but the bed is still gonna be steel, um, probably for robustness and cost of repair, but um, yeah, it's, they've gotta do something to cut weight, make it more efficient, because, um, they sell tons of these, and they're not that great on fuel economy. So speaking of not, uh, not a very heavy vehicle, this is one of the lightest things we probably will see, is the Lamborghini concept revealed, uh, was revealed on Monday out at MIT of all places, uh, Massachusetts randomly, not far from Boston. The Millennial, the, excuse me, the Terzo Millennio, it's kind of hard to say, I think I'm saying that right, but it's a supercar concept that's basically showing all the things that Lamborghini is thinking of doing for you know their future supercars you know 
It's got like a super capacitator uh, as part of the power plant. It's got carbon fiber. It's got, you know, crazy design, uh, all sorts of like scoops and fancy aero treatments. Uh, and it's, you know, this is sort of like what they're shooting for, what they might do, you know, with the, you know, next generation, probably two generations out for like the Aventador and, you know, the rest of their lineup. Yeah, we saw a teaser for this on Friday, and at the time we were like, oh, maybe this is going to be the next Aventador. And then we saw it this week, and we're like, this is way, way uh, advanced. Uh, so yeah, like to your point, this is a generation or two still out. Um, but yeah, it looks awesome. I mean, it's a new Lamborghini-like concept, and it's Lamborghini is them, like, production ones are already, like, crazy and over the top. So uh, this is even better. It's got, like you said, the supercapacitor, um, it's so advanced like powertrain technology and battery technology and I think that's why they debuted it with uh, M at MIT is because uh, some of the technology in the battery and electrification technology is from MIT um, but yeah it's awesome I I still like supercars I know a lot of people become uh, jaded with them and like oh you know you can't buy them I, I still think these look cool I mean this is stuff we put on our bedroom walls as a kid. It's it's a new Lamborghini. It's awesome. Maybe they'll throw the Kutak name on it or something. That'd be cool. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, like, I agree with you. There's always going to be a market for supercars. I mean, it's it's like, to a certain extent, they're like yachts or something, like private yachts. Like, yes, the technology is going to change. The execution is going to change. But there's always going to be people with a lot of money who want these fancy toys. And even in, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, when we get to this era of, you know, everything's probably electrified and autonomous and there's all these fancy grids and everything's on a network, you're still going to want to drive a car fast. You know, it might be like people, you know, look at horse racing today or something, but it'll probably still exist in different forms. And I think that's what Lamborghini's play is with, uh, you know, this concept. And it certainly looks really good, too. I mean, as far as concept cars go, it's exactly what, to me, a concept car should be. It's kind of crazy. It's attention-getting. It makes a design statement, and it gives you a preview of what's you know to come next. Yeah, I agree on all counts, and uh, it's, it's everything we kind of want from a Lamborghini concept. And to your point, like about people still wanting these, like Lamborghini and Ferrari are selling more cars now than they ever have. I mean, Ferrari is artificially limiting production because they don't. W they want it to still be exclusive. So uh, demand is still there, and I think it will continue to be. Cool. So, I mean, we will not be driving this car anytime soon, but it's probably a good time to talk about the cars we have been driving. Yeah. We've had some good ones. Uh, I think one of the favorite ones to come through uh, uh, our fleet this week, or really any week, is the Range Rover Sport. We had a 2017 that uh, was bright red. It was loaded up. It was super powerful, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, you and I were talking off camera here. It's just so loud. It's like that engine just is like, it's crazy. And it's, you know, to me, it's like one of the most muscular SUVs you could buy. Yeah, I mean, it's got the five liter from the F-Type in there. It's awesome. I mean, that is one of the best sounding engines of all time. It's a supercharged five liter V8, uh, making upwards of 500 horsepower. And I mean, even in standard, like, key up mode, the exhaust cracks and pops and burbles uh, just like you'd want it to. I mean. Yes, you're driving this massive, like, kind of wedge, um, but kind of makes it more fun knowing that you're just driving this super powerful brick. I mean, I love fast SUVs. I like the BMW X5. I like the AMG uh, SUVs. It's nobody makes wagons anymore, so in my mind, these are kind of the modern fast wagon. But yeah, this thing's awesome. I mean, it looks cool. Uh, the one we've got is this nice red color, but. Uh, all the promo shots are these, this nice deep blue, mm -hmm. um, dark wheels. This one's got red and black interior, and I really am a big fan of red leather. Um, so I'm a big fan of the interior. But yeah, that engine, that engine is awesome. It's pretty great. It makes a lot of noise. It woke, it's the kind of thing that like, I drove it last night and it made, you know, I left for work pretty early and it, it woke some people up, I'd like to think. It's like you start that thing and yeah, man, a cold morning here in uh, Metro Detroit, that thing, it sounds good. It sounds good right when you start it up, even on a cold morning. So, and it actually, like, the funny thing about this is you might think it, like, you say it's driving a brick. 
I thought for what it is, it handles pretty well. You know, you can turn it, you can see out of it pretty well. Um, it's, it's really drivable. Yeah, I mean, it does handle well, and I'm sure it's Lamborghini, I'm sorry, Lamborghini. Land Rover. Range Rover uh, markets, it, markets it as the most capable Range Rover there's ever been because it's not the largest, but it is probably the most powerful and the most sport oriented. And you do put it in dynamic mode and the steering firms up pretty well and it's reasonably quick and the feedback is fine for an SUV. Um, I wouldn't put it on a track day, but it's, it's not wallowy, it's not soft. Um, it doesn't float around like a, uh, some even like modern muscle cars do. Uh, yeah, it's nice, it, it's supremely competent. More so than it actually probably needs to be, but I'm not gonna complain. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely worth, you know, it's an expensive vehicle and it gives you, it delivers on that promise. It, you know, you pay for something like that, but it gives you capability and performance. So it's, it's definitely worth it. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we had a 2017 Mazda CX-3 in our fleet. Uh, also a crossover, but I think the comparisons pretty much end there. It, uh, that was fun to drive. It looks pretty good. Uh, I think you get a lot of that sort of Mazda zoom zoom dynamics, even though the CX-3 is uh, it's a little slightly higher up. It looks a little bit more like a crossover, uh, but it's, you know, it's the segment that's really red hot right now. And this to me is a, it's a good choice if you're in that market. Yeah, it's, to me, it essentially looks like a slightly lifted Mazda 3 hatch. Mm -hmm which is not a bad thing. Um, I mean, people want crossovers, and if Mazda's willing to build a like, good, like, very well-driving crossover, awesome. And it does drive well. Uh, the steering is surprisingly good. The suspension um, is firm, but without being harsh. Um, it drives well. Like, uh, it's not the quickest thing out there, but... Uh, Naturally. Yeah, it's... No Mazda is really, like, a burner right now. Um, I mean, everybody talks about the Miata being underpowered, but that's neither here nor there. Mazdas are quick enough, uh, and they're more handling cars. And this is a nice, like, handling SUV. Um, now, size-wise, it's kind of small for the class. I mean, you could probably fit this thing inside the Range Rover. Sure. Um, but if you want a good driving dynamics for a compact crossover, it's a pretty good choice. Pretty solid, and you get that Mazda signature design. I think most of their cars and crossovers look really good right now. You know, that language that they're using, it's like the latest evolution of Kodo, I think. Uh, it looks good, and it hangs well in different segments. Like, you would think, well, is Mazda's, like, is the Mazda 3 going to really work for in this, like, CX-3 kind of compact crossover design? And it does translate, I think. And it, um, you know, you've got the headlights up front. They usually have like slightly longer hoods, they're creased, and it's, it's a good look. I mean, inside the interiors, I'm not always as wild about them. Uh, this one was decent though, not wild about the infotainment. I'm still not a huge fan of that knob, the way they, the knob is fine, it's just like how the knob is used is kind of weird, I think, as far as like getting through the different pages of the infotainment. Uh, but, you know, that's getting pretty granular. Otherwise, it looks okay. Uh, it looks pretty good, actually. Um, you know, to your point, it is pretty small, though. Uh, but it's competitive, I think, in the segment, definitely. Yeah, if you can live with the size, uh, I think it's a solid choice. And it's, I agree with the styling. It, it's a very handsome vehicle. A lot of the cars in this class, for example, kind of do this, like, almost cartoonish, like, super sporty looking. Yeah. Uh, to stand out because it is a young buyer segment, so they kind of want to appeal to um, that sports car thing uh, that a lot of millennials want to do. But Mazda just builds a really handsome hatchback, and I mm -hmm. think it's a better play. I think it's I would re way way uh, rather drive this uh, than a CHR. Uh, it looks better. I think it drives better. It's quicker because the CHR is kind of anemic. Uh, but yeah, it's I like the CX3. Crossovers aren't my thing, but uh, I could totally recommend it to somebody looking for one. Absolutely. I think it's definitely, like, I think we agree on this. It's the kind of thing where if you're in the market for this and you want something that's different than, you know, different, you know, things from Chevy, Honda, et cetera, you're like, oh, what's that? Oh, that's a Mazda. That's cool. Not everybody has one, and, you know, maybe that's your play. But uh, moving on, uh, one of our... Uh, 
producers here, Chris McGraw, uh, one of our senior producers, recently went to Iceland. He had a heck of a trip. Uh, we're going to have him on here in just a few moments, but check out this video. This gives you a taste of what he did. He had an amazing adventure. Iceland was amazing, uh, but check this out. In the happy camper. This is an old Renault van. It has uh, just shy of 275,000 kilometers on the odometer. And this is a, it's like a tall van. And you can't really tell by looking outside right now, uh, but it's, it's like super windy outside. And you can definitely feel the wind coming across this van. They said that most of the accidents that these get into involve the, the wind more than anything. The wind or sheep crossing the road. Wow, that, wow, looks, that like looks like a lot, lot of fun. fun. Joining, joining us now to tell us all about it, Chris McGraw. Yeah, it was uh, quite the adventure. adventure. Um, we were actually supposed to go to Iceland. The way we scheduled the trip was to drive a Toyota Land Cruiser 76. And about a week before we left, I got an email one morning and someone who was renting it before we were uh, going to get there had crashed it. So that kind of <laughs> threw, threw a wrench Whoops. to our plans. So instead of just canceling the trip, we decided to take a rental camper van, like the one you saw in that video, and uh, drive around Iceland. Um, it, it, that video makes Iceland look like a, a wonderful <laughs> place, and it is. It's a great place. Uh, we got there. It was raining and about 35 degrees, but you know, it, I was ready to go. First day was great. It's um, a Renault traffic camper van. Uh, so there's like a bunk bed inside. Uh, the seats lay down flat. So some, there's like a queen size bed. And then there's a bench that kind of can flip over the other way. There's a kitchen inside this thing. There is running water. And there's a separate heater tied to a different battery. And we're just hauling through uh, the Golden Circle in Iceland. And the second day we're driving and we're going about you know 30 kilometers an hour on the highway and or on the street and it just stalled on us. Oof. And I was like, no big deal. I've been in manuals that have stalled before, though none of them have stalled while I was just cruising down the road. So <laughs> I pulled up to the stop sign and would not turn over. So that was the uh, the big thing there. We were stuck on the side of the road for 18 hours. Wow. So that was our uh, the the biggest issue there. We got a, a new camper van. Um, and uh, and got to finish off the trip, but um, it was definitely it wasn't uh, the smoothest trip uh, that I've ever been on. Though a lot of the trips that we go on have issues. We showed up to New Zealand, and the Range Rover we were supposed to drive wasn't there, and so it's just one of the things you you plan on go going wrong. That's so. wild. So 18 hours. What did you do during this 18 hour span? <laughs> yeah. So luckily, uh, the one thing that the van didn't have was a bathroom. Luckily, uh. we were only a mile away from one of the uh, waterfalls that had like a restaurant and hotels. So that wasn't gotcha. too bad. Um, we planned on cooking every meal out of this van while we were there. So okay. we had food. And since the battery was separate um, from the one that we were trying to use to start the car, uh, we were still able to uh, use the running water and use the heater. So we just uh, cooked cooked food and tried to just catch up on sleep as much as possible. And then uh, we ended up walking into town quite often because, uh, yeah, it, it was a long 18 hours. stuck. That's pretty wild. There. I mean, 18 hours. Like, I'm thinking, like, what am I going to be doing 18 hours from now? That's like 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. And if you told me, Greg, you're outside for this time <laughs> period um, and the bathrooms are a mile away, I'm not sure I'd sign up for that, yeah. but that's quite the adventure. Yeah, no, I, I probably, I probably wouldn't do the the same exact trip. Now right. that I've experienced it in a camper van, I probably wouldn't do the same exact trip again. But, um, but for someone who's looking to go there and maybe doesn't want to go the rental car or hotel mm -hmm. route, it's definitely a it's an interesting way to go for sure. Now Iceland's a great place. It's very trendy right now. I was fortunate enough to go last summer. It's um it's just beautiful. And it's like it literally wasn't even on the map for tourists until probably the last five, six years. And now tourism's like taking over their economy almost. Yeah. It's really a strong uh you know strong element of it. What's like one thing you would recommend doing? you know, whatever your budget is sort of thing. Totally, yeah. Um, so, like, yeah, like you said, in, in 2014, there were only 900,000 tourists that visited the entire year. And 
last year they're already up to 1.8 million. So it's like it's definitely booming right now. Um, the one thing that I would recommend that we did was go to um, the Blue Lagoon, which is right okay. by the uh, Keflavik Airport. You get a shuttle from the airport. And what this is is they built a power plant um, that used the, the volcanic activity to, to create power. And part of like what was created then was this, this hot spring. And people started bathing in this hot spring. It's full of minerals. And so they decided to monetize it, basically. And so now they're building uh, hotels, and there's like a spa inside. And just through this hot spring, like it replenishes every 40 hours. So you might think, oh, it's gross how many tourists are like sitting in this one giant hot tub. Well, no, <laughs> it's, it's new water every 40 hours. So like you're not, it's not like a gross place to be hanging out. It's like really nice. and. When we were there, when we got there, um, the water's like 100 degrees, so it's like a hot tub. It's awesome. And there's like different levels if you don't, like, depending on how much you want to spend. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you can uh, you can just hang out, and it was like snowing, but you're mostly in the water, so it's it was just refreshing. There's like bars around the sides and everything. Really cool. Um, beyond that, uh, if you're sightseeing, definitely the Golden Circle. You mm. can do that in a day. Um, and that's what we did our first day uh, before we broke down. My, the, my favorite thing that we did was uh, to visit this old U.S. Navy plane that crash landed on the beach in the 70s. And uh, everyone survived. They just left the plane there. It's about two and a half miles off the road, so you could just park and hike down to the beach. It's a like a Black Rock beach. It's really cool. And they just have this abandoned plane there. It's very it's a great place to shoot some awesome Instagram photos for sure. If I go back, I will definitely do that. That's that's exactly up my like alley of what I would do. That's it sounds great. So your video, uh, we have a clip of it. Uh, yeah. You know, you're watching at home. When? How can people watch this video? So we are editing it right now, okay. um, and it should be up on the site uh, within the next couple of weeks. So just uh, stay tuned. It'll be cool. on our Facebook, it'll be on our YouTube, and it'll be up on site. Cool. Now this is one you're not going to want to miss, especially if you're a fan of travel and adventures. Uh, this is something, you know, we're trying to do more of an auto blog. We have awesome cars, but the best thing you can do with awesome cars is go somewhere awesome with them. So let's have, uh, have a look here at the video. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Alright, All right, so now we're doing arguments. arguments.
We've now come to the section of the podcast that we like to call Carguments. This is where the hosts argue, we fight it out, over two, uh, two things we think are actually both pretty good. Uh, and this time we're going to talk about sport wagons. I'm going to take the Jaguar, Jaguar Sport Brake, which I think is gorgeous, and you're going to take the Mercedes E400. Yeah, I, I mean, I love to tell people they're wrong, and in this case, I get to tell you you're wrong, that the XFS Sport Brake is the best wagon out there right now. I mean, Mercedes does wagons. They've been doing wagons for years. Nobody does wagons better than Mercedes. And the E400's great. I mean, I, sure, I love the AMGs, but this is it's a quiet, comfortable, uh, nice-looking wagon. Um, it's got the nice 3-liter from the E43. Um, but, yeah, it's got a rear-facing third row. I mean, what more do you want from a wagon? I will say the rear-facing third row is awesome in that car, but I'm going to throw some numbers at you, even though for a moment I actually forgot the name of the car I was arguing for. Whoops. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong. It's awesome. 69.7 cubic feet with the seats down. That's more than the Mercedes. Uh, plenty of room. It's got the uh, V6 that makes 380 horsepower, which is an awesome engine. It sounds good. It's got plenty of power. That outguns the E400, which is 329. So, I mean, you want more space, you want more power, why don't you want the Jaguar? It's just not as cool, man. Like, it's a Mercedes wagon, and like, Mercedes wagons are just cool. I mean, I'm sure the Sport Brake is nice, and but the interior is going to be better, and come on, are you going to really be tracking this every day? I want something that's going to be comfortable. But 380 horsepower is going to give you a lot of a get up from lights. It's, uh, here's the other thing. The E400 is basically an E-Class. A lot of people have E-Classes. Not as many people have Jaguars, which also speaks to their sales, but the fact is, is it is a more exclusive look. It's fancy, it brings that, a little bit of almost like that cool British James Bond sort of thing into what's essentially a crossover. And here's the other thing. If you're gonna buy this car, you want something different. Because if you just want a crossover, then you get an X3 or an X5 or something, or an F-Pace. If you want the wagon, you by nature, by definition, you're going for something different, which is cool. So by nature, by definition, take the Jaguar. You do, I do like your point about buying something different. Uh, I also want to buy something that works. And if we're talking British engineering versus German engineering, come on. I, I love Jaguars and I love Land Rovers, but they don't have the best reputation. And well, I, That's I, like 20 years too late, though. I mean, come on. 20 years. I think we're talking uh, maybe Maybe ten. five years. <laughs> but they're doing a lot better now that they're uh, no longer under the uh, umbrella of Ford, but uh, come on. Mercedes wagons are just cool. I will give you the one thing I really like about, well, I like the E400. It's a great car, but the third row, that's pretty cool. Facing, you know, all right, that's something the Jaguar doesn't have, but when you pull up to the valet and, you know, you hand your key fob out, the just there's no comparison the jaguar is just cooler the design it's like really like all of that great jaguar design in a wagon to me that's just such a special thing and you know the infotainment is pretty good in jaguars right now i mean it looks good anyway to your point the you know reliability is a little sketchy probably sometimes with that infotainment uh but it's so much fun and we got to leave it there we're out of time so there's really no way to score that or decide who wins but uh I think the winner kind of is you. If you want a sport wagon or a sport luxury wagon, whether you're into a Jaguar or a Mercedes, this is a really good time to buy. Yeah, I mean, wagons are cool. Wagons are always, like, have been cool forever. Um, you, they kind of went out of phase for a while in the 80s because everybody grew up in them, and they then we got minivans. And while minivans are very practical and, like, utilitarian, they just, they're not cool like uh, wagons are. Um, the fact that you can get that we are uh, awash in choices, whether it be a Mercedes, whether it be a Jaguar, um, is pretty great. I mean, you can get affordable wagons. They make uh, Jetta, uh, sorry, the Golf and Audi. I mean, everybody's doing it. I mean, it's mostly Europeans, but it's still pretty good. I would really be into either a CTS V sport wagon, which would be awesome. You have to get a used one now, or a Vista Cruiser, which is really used. If you're going to start laying on the wagons, there's some pretty cool ones, used market anyway. Uh, but we've got to move on. We've hit triple zeros for quite some time now. We're moving on to spend my money. 
uh, one of our favorite segments, one of your favorite segments, where we spend your money and we try to help you answer some questions here about what cars you might want to buy. And if you're in the market for a car, check out the Autoblog Car Finder. You can use it to figure out, you know, help you figure out what your next purchase might be. Uh, use it in this case, see if you agree with what our recommendations are, you know. So this is a loyal reader. He actually has written to us before. Uh, basically, the situation is he's had some bad luck. He's got a 2003 Corolla was T-boned and the Chrysler 300 was then rear-ended. So he's back in the market for a car. Lay it on you here. Fourteen to $20,000 budget, maybe thirty dollars if new. Uh, he's buying in Ontario, which I believe is actually south Detroit because yeah. it's south of us. A good chunk of it is anyway. Uh, this gentleman's six foot three, two 230 pounds, so he's probably bigger than most of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, he's looking for a uh, fuel economy of 28 miles per gallon, uh, leather front seats, uh, space for a couple bikes uh, for no wheels, things like that. Safety is key. Primary usage is he wants to commute. Uh, he has some long trips, a little bit of daily driving. Uh, vehicle type, this is where it gets uh, interesting. He's not picky. He's willing to be like a segment buster. Uh, SUV would be nice, but he's also considering coupes and, of course, wagons. Uh, like this this is the best part of the email in bold he's like he would like something a little bit unique boil it down here here are the choices 2016 nissan rogue sl all-wheel drive the 17 cx5 from mazda the 2014 ford fusion se or a 2017 chevy malibu which is fairly similar 2014 cts with the sport package and the 3.6 liter v6 or one of my favorites the 2014 ford flex that's quite the roundup. Um, quick reaction. Which one would you go with? So of the ones he listed, I like the CX-5 the best. I know you said it might be a little tight on headroom. Uh, maybe you can find one without the moonroof. I think that would be the option to go. But if I had to make some suggestions off your list, really got two. Uh, you want good fuel economy, so and you want space for bicycles. So I'm going to say either a Golf Alltrack which is going to be weird. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Uh, it's going to have plenty of room. It's going to get good fuel economy. And you live in Ontario, so it's going to have all-wheel drive. Um, as we were talking this, or if you, while you were going over the criteria, I'm going to throw another one out there, the new Honda Accords. Uh, you can get one for around 30 New Hampshire. You can go read the review online. It's really phenomenal. Um, and if you're looking at Malibus, you're looking at Fusions, it's probably a little more expensive, but it will beat your uh, $30,000 new car budget. So either the Golf Alltrack or the new Honda Accord would be my two choices. Two excellent choices. I'm going to keep it pretty simple. Ford Flex right there. It's boxy. It's old school. You could get a pretty good deal on one. Uh, they have good, you know, reli reliability ratings. You know, it's a tough vehicle. You can certainly put a lot of things in it. Uh, it doesn't look like really anything on the road anymore. It looked weird when it was new. Uh, it still looks different just because that styling really went back to an era of car design that we hadn't seen in quite some time. Uh, I'm not sure if the 14 model, you can get the optional cooler or uh, refrigerator, whatever that option is. But on one of the newer models that I actually tested in the last couple of years, you could basically get a cooler or a freezer in the middle of the second row, which I would totally do. It just seems like the thing you would need. You're in Canada, it's probably pretty cold. You maybe don't need a cooler, but still. To me, it's a simple choice. It's all-wheel drive, it looks good, it puts everything you could possibly need in it. You're uh, six foot three, 230 pounds. Yeah, you want a little bit of space, you want to spread out. Uh, 2014 Ford Flex is gonna have basically the most, one of the more recent versions of sync in it, so they've figured out kind of most of the bugs in there. Uh, the rest of the interior is pretty nice. Yeah, for me, it would be it'd be Flex all the way. Good choice. I mean, I like the Flex. It's getting a little uh, long in the tooth, but it's still a really good car. I mean, it's it's going back to wagons. They may market it as a crossover, but it's a wagon. Yeah. It's a minivan, really. It's totally, yeah. It's, it's a troop transporter. It's awesome. Plus, it's the only car I can actually flex. If you're listening to this on your phone, you can't see what I'm doing, but if you're watching it, you can see that I'm flexing, and I think that's kind of a fun thing to do. It's a great name of a car. If you can get one with all-wheel drive and the 3.5 EcoBoost, I mean, it's a genuinely, like, quick little uh, car. Not little, but... 
Yeah, really a lot big of fun. car it's that's powerful yeah. and fun and yeah. Flex is a good choice. So a couple of good options here. Uh, Alexander was the reader writer who sent in that uh, that missive. Thanks for doing that. We love that you continue to listen to the podcast and watch the podcast. Uh, let us know how that turns out. Uh, we hope um, we hope you have a you know good car buying experience again. Use our car finder on uh, you know the auto blog homepage to help you out. And you know again, let us know how it turns out. And that is how the this uh, episode of the podcast turns out. It's a lot of fun, a lot of news. We drove a lot of cool cars. Hope you enjoyed that little postcard from Chris in Iceland. Uh, we've been doing a lot of cool things. If there's anything you want to know about, you know, the cars we're driving or any subjects you'd like to see us kind of really dive into, send us a note, tweet at us, leave us a note here on this Facebook live stream. And, uh, you know, for Reese, uh, I'm Greg. Thanks for watching this week.